Monday, April 11th on the Just Baseball Show. That's Jack McMullen and I'm Peter Apple. And on the back half of this episode, we are talking top five teams in college baseball as well as two surprising as we hit the midseason point of the college baseball season. But we also like to talk some MLB stuff. So we're going to break down a couple of storylines that I'm looking at. And I have Jack just to bounce things off. It's a perfect Tuesday. How are you? I, I'm great. I am along for the ride today okay. which is really fun because you're talking with peter flaherty uh i guess like old friend like peter flaherty new title of baseball america I call him, here he's a secret weapon that's why i think we should refer to him he's kind of like the you know the ace yeah in your hand he's just so good at talking about college baseball he's an encyclopedia of knowledge and i love to just pick his brain on some things that he's seeing because of course like when i turn on the college baseball game i'm watching for the stars like i'm watching lsu i'm watching florida i'm watching all these teams like looking for that next great mlb player that's why i love watching college baseball but he has those like diamonds in the rough the players who you know maybe not pop off the page but can be third rounders fourth fifth day two guys all that kind of stuff that you have to watch out for that could end up being big pieces of a team one day and we got to gush over dylan cruz the number one overall pick who's hitting 525 Yes, Pirates fans are going to be very happy with uh, two cruise missiles, one C-R-U-Z, um, one C-R-E-W-S, but both cruise missiles. Uh, you also talk Langford and Caglione, which is great for Florida. This kid, Jack Caglione, like, I'm, I'm going to save the conversation for, for the Peters in the back half hour, but, like, what a fucking freak show, man. College baseball, Shohei Otani, striking it's on 11 crazy. for 9. Leading the nation in home runs. He's a freakazoid. So if you remember, it, like if you were kind of in to college baseball in the mid-2010s, then you remember Brendan McKay, who was the third yeah. overall pick by Tampa. And, and McKay did look like a guy that could be a two-way talent at the major league level. But he, he abandoned hitting, and he's just been dealing with so many injuries. I think it's a nagging shoulder thing yeah. that has just kind of derailed his entire career. McKay's turning into a what-if story, which sucks, because I met him once, really nice guy. Caglione is elevated McKay. Like, he's he's obviously below Shohei Otani, but he pumps out, like, 115 to 118 off the bat at ease, and then he's like one of the best strikeout artists in America out of a starting rotation. He sits like 96, 97. So he's not Shohei. I think he's probably better than McKay. So he's somewhere yeah. in between, but closer to McKay. Basically, if there was a pick for the next Shohei, it would be him right now. Now, that's not saying, you know, anything could happen. We saw it with Brendan McKay, just like you said, right. anything can happen. But if we look at the talent of a guy who can shut down an offense on the mound while leading the nation in home runs, he's not just like a good hitter and good pitcher. Yeah, the ERA might not look great, but the strikeout numbers are. The stuff is great. And he's leading the nation in home runs, leading it. That's the thing, man. So like Caglione, and we'll move off college ball here in a moment, but I think the most slept on thing about Otani, despite being really fast, which is your favorite slept on. Do you know that? Did you know I that? Did. I was aware. <laughs> um, Fast. The, the most slept on thing about Otani is he is sneaky, a mammoth human being. He's mammoth. a huge dude. We were on the field of the World Baseball Classic, and that was my biggest takeaway was I was like, he's bigger than Pete Alonso? He's big, like, man. Way bigger? Yes. What? <laughs> yeah. He's a mammoth, yeah. huge guy. And Caglione, from what I've seen of Caglione, is a mammoth guy. Like, Listen, throw your man card away for 30 seconds. Take a look at Jack Caglione in baseball pants. You're going to be sold on this guy being an all-star. It plays. It, it plays. plays. <laughs> it plays. <laughs> All right, the MLB portion of this podcast. I got a couple of pitchers who I wanted to reference. Um, but first, of course, we did get the news. O'Neill Cruz out 10 to 12 weeks with the fractured ankle. It really, really sucks. But it's better than I thought because the injury on the field, which incited a bench clearing, I don't even want to call it a brawl. It was more of uh hold me back, hold me back. That seems to be what most baseball fights are this day. And this was kind of the definition of it. Kopech was, you know, getting super heated. And I don't know if it was for good reason. I don't really care. It wasn't really a brawl. But the main takeaway from it is 
I thought there was a chance O'Neill Cruz would be out for the season, but 10 to 12 weeks, it sucks, but it is better than I thought it was going to be. It is much, much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, thankfully, it was an ankle thing and it wasn't an Achilles or anything like that. There was no tendon. It was a bone fracture, which you really, you know, you almost thank your lucky stars because the thing about O'Neill Cruz is he is so stupidly explosive. Um, like that's why he's so much fun to watch because the arm is explosive. The bat is explosive and the feet, like the legs. He is one of the fastest guys in baseball by sprint speed. So you're worried that, you know, ligament damage in his knee would take away some of that explosion coming from his lower half. Um, you can heal entirely from an ankle fracture in 12 weeks, which is good. So this isn't going to sacrifice any of O'Neill Cruz's athleticism, which I think was the best thing. Um, but yeah, man, like, Sounds like we'll get him on a rehab appearance in Indianapolis, which selfishly is going to be pretty cool uh, to see him again, even though I watched him for two months last year. But uh, yeah, that could have been much, much worse. I'm glad that it isn't. So I brought you a couple of pitchers that have been really, really impressing me because you and Aram, you broke down a lot of the big storylines of from the weekend in baseball. Yeah. Um, and you talked about the Rays. You know, I could talk forever about Jeffrey Springs and Drew Rasmussen, how good they have been. But again, you're facing the A's, you're facing these teams, but they're still Major League Baseball players and they're still dominating. But outside of the Rays, because believe it or not, there are other good, really good pitchers in the league. Yeah. One guy that is already just, you know, I made him my Cy Young favorite in the American League, and he's been as good as advertised, not allowing a run yet. Like, Kevin Gosman is just on top of his game right now. 12 innings, 14 Ks. He has three walks, which is even above his standards because he doesn't walk anybody. He's that true horse that the Blue Jays need after watching, you know, Barrios get blown up for a second time. Bassett did look good in his second start from a box score perspective, but the stuff, it's just, he's got a curveball that doesn't, do anything for me he doesn't quite look like the same pitcher even though the box score looks good I think Blue Jays fans would agree with that Chris Bassett there is something there that you don't love Manoa came back through a seven inning shutout but again didn't the stuff wasn't what we're used to with Manoa but the one pitcher who every fifth day I know Blue Jays fans can rely on and the rest of baseball can just marvel at is Kevin Gosman I think he started the year off even I mean he hasn't allowed a run yet that's the bottom line has not allowed a run through 12 innings against yeah. good lineups. Yeah. I mean, like we were streak watching with Gosman to open the year last year because he went what, like 29 innings without walking anybody. And so yeah. far he's walked three in 12 innings. So now it's my turn to tell you why Kevin Gosman's a, a fraud and like bust. Rome has fallen. Agreed. Yet. Bust 32 year old bust. I'm with you. No, I mean, 14 K's three walks. He's faced 51 hitters. This guy has gone 12 innings in two starts. That's excellent from him. And you mentioned the most important number of them all, and that's that he has yet to allow an earned run, which is awesome. And that is what gets guys paid. Gosman is reliable. I think Manoa, as the years go on, is going to be considered reliable. But you and I are not Bassett guys. Like, Feels like T-ball sometimes. And his first start of the year was a mutilation of Chris Bassett. Barrios is like the biggest wild card ever. Because he looked kind of fine in Anaheim this weekend, which was interesting. But he then not fine really. for like an inning. And then he got crushed again. And then I know. You know, he let a couple so, guys on. Then Adam Simber came in. Then Mike Trout took him 450. And then just things unraveled. And then they had to win a game 12-10. Like their we, offense is crazy. But the reason I wanted to bring up Kevin Gosman is... In the He's back of my mind, bedrock. He's reliable when nobody else is. In the back of my mind, I think to myself, "All right, if Kevin Gosman is on the mound, and that Blue Jays bullpen is rested, and they're hitting like they are, they, I feel like they'll win every single one of those starts against anybody, road, home, doesn't matter. Like Kevin Gosman on the mound with that offense, and if they have a rested bullpen, feels to me like." the best team in baseball, if that makes sense, for that day. Every fifth day when you have Kevin Gosman on the mound feels like an impossible game for the other team to win. Yeah, like right now, obviously it is because he's got a 0, zero, zero ERA. But um, I totally see what you're saying. And I think that that lineup is, it's not must-see TV every night because like 
hey, you know, you watch some other exciting guys. But, you know, you, you take Vladdy and Bo Bichette, then you had Matt Chapman, who's off to like the best start of his career. And, and we were talking about him. They, like Springer looks great. Dalton freaking Varsho looks excellent, man. I'm all in on Dalton Varsho. That guy's a star. Um, but man, like I think this lineup and and any reliability you get from Gosman and hopefully Manoa moving forward will, will turn this team into a very scary team. What sucks the most about Toronto is like we just have to come to terms with the fact that Jose Barrio sucks now. Sucks. Which is crazy. He was an $130 million guy ahead of last year, and he sucks now. Former Blue Jay, another guy that I wanted to talk about, the Stro Show, man. He's real good right now. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's allowed to run either. 0.00 ERA. He's got he's got 12 innings pitch, 14 Ks. He's got six walks. Um, which of course you don't like to see, but the stuff looks so good. And I was looking back at, you know, kind of his stretch from September to October of last year with the Cubs. Dude was unbelievable, and he's just parlayed that into a really good start for the season. I think both of us were a little bit concerned with the Cubs starting pitching. Like, we like Hayden Wesneski. Jameson Tyon is like, all right, six innings, three runs. Like, we got to score four to win. You know, you go up and down the rotation. But if Stroman can be that guy, the Cubs are better than I thought they were because when he's on the mound, they they haven't lost. And... He just keeps accumulating these great starts, and this dates back a couple of months into last season, too. He's the Stroh Show, man. He's really doing it. Yeah, no, I mean, he is he's good, man. And, like, I think that's just an objective point now. And, and love him or hate him all you want because of the off-the-field, you know, like his persona. Yeah, like, yeah. there's nothing he's done that's, like, bad. You know what I mean? It's just he's not a likable guy to some. Um Stroman is a very good pitcher and he's a very good baseball player. And Marcus Stroman, I think is going to have, you know, an ERA in the low threes this year. I think that's the kind of guy that Stroman is. That's the kind of guy he's been his entire career thing that jumps out about Stroman. You know, we talked about yesterday that Nick Lodolo is the perfect pitcher for great American ballpark. Marcus Stroman's kind of the perfect pitcher for Wrigley field. Cause we talk about wind blowing out at Wrigley automatic over Marcus Stroman in his start on Saturday against Texas at Wrigley, eight ground balls, no fly ball outs. I mean, he keeps the ball on the ground, man. Like you keep the ball on the ground and you've got Dansby Swanson and Nico Horner playing up the gut for you. That's a recipe for immense success. And and that's what Stroman has done. Another guy who's seen his stuff tick up and another guy who keeps the ball on the ground is the new Minnesota twin. Pablo Lopez has looked unbelievably good. Right last year, he was throwing around 93, 94. This season, he's 95 to 96. And that sweeper that he started to throw, he didn't really throw it last year. It was more of this like curveball. But now it's this 84 mile an hour sweeper that he started throwing a ton. He's actually thrown it 48 times all to right handed hitters. This is a really good pitch. And when he's throwing this hard and keeping the ball on the ground at a 47% rate and he doesn't allow runs. This could be the Twins' ace this year. Yeah, I mean, they've all looked good. You know what I mean? Like, he's got competition. The only one that hasn't looked good is Mally. Like, Pablo Lopez has looked great. You mentioned 12 and a third. He's He's got a .73. He's allowed one earned run in 12 and a third. Joe Ryan, 12 innings, six hits, punched out 16. Sonny Gray, 12 innings, seven hits, one earned. Kenta Maeda was great in his first start. Five innings, of one run ball. So, Mally is the runt of the litter right now, which is crazy because Mally at his best is a three. All these guys at their best are threes, except maybe Pablo and, and Joe Ryan, I'd say. Sonny was a two. I think his best now is a three. I think Joe Ryan's best is a two. And I think Pablo's best is like a top flight two. Like we talk about him in the same light that you know, Fromber's a better pitcher, but I think we talk about him in the same light as Fromber, where where Fromber can be a one and he is the one now, uh, but he was the best two in baseball last year. And that's Pablo Lopez at his very best. Another guy who, when I watch, I think he's a one. (laughs) It's just he's struggled to stay healthy. Dustin May is a freak of nature for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I love what he's been doing. And I was listening to the Dodgers broadcast, and it's an adjustment that he made. And 
you know, this guy could just make adjustments because he throws 100. But, you know, he was very sinker slider and he was kind of nibbling around the zone. And I think the Dodgers said, what the fuck are you doing? You throw in a 100 mile an hour fastball, throw it down the middle, dare these people to hit it. And nobody can hit it because it's 100 and his long levers, the extension he gets on it. I can hear it through the television. <laughs> Bust into Austin Barnes or Will Smith's glove. This guy is such a freak. And, you know, the Dodgers, they have Kershaw, they have Arias, you know, they have these starting pitchers. But if Dustin May can stay healthy, I think he's the most talented of the bunch, even more talented than a guy like Julio Arias. Like Arias is a better pitcher because he stays healthy and he tallies up 175 to 185 innings like he has over the past two seasons. So he's you can rely on him much more. But if one start, everyone's fully healthy, I think Dodger fans would say, give me Dustin May. And I would say, give me Dustin May over a lot of pitchers in Major League Baseball right now. He has the same effect of glass now, that if they just stay healthy, they look impossible to hit. They're both in this 6'6 six, six to 6'8 six, range, crazy long arms with unbelievable stuff. Right now, Dustin May is sitting with a 0.69 ERA. It's funny that he doesn't strike out guys like you'd think, but it's he's a soft contact guy. Like you make contact with the baseball, and although it's coming in at a hundred, it doesn't go out a hundred, it goes out like eighty-eight. He's just so damn good and fun to watch. Yeah. So Dustin May is sitting 97 with a sinker right now. Like, come on, right? Come on. Um, May, if you look at starters that are sitting harder than Dustin May is at this point with a sinker. Uh, you're looking at Sandy, uh, and that's it. Jordan Hicks is like a multi-inning reliever. He's thrown a, a bit, but the only two guys that have like thrown more sinkers that sit at a higher speed as starting pitchers or like multi-inning relievers are, are Hicks and Sandy Alcantara, and that is excellent, excellent company to be in. I'm with you on May being, you know, like his best, maybe better than Julio's best. Um, the way that I view it, if you were to stack those four in 2023, the year of our Lord, um, Walker Bueller is like one of the very few guys that I will take. Like if I get a hundred percent of Walker Bueller, I'm taking a hundred percent of him over Dustin May. Me too. So if, if you gave me the a hundredth percentile outcome start for all these guys, I mean, shit, dude, it's like perfect game for all of them. But I go Walker Bueller, Dustin May, Julio Reyes, Clayton Kershaw in 2023, Clayton Kershaw. It's crazy, right? Yes. The best pitcher of our generation who's still like, he's still like, he's like 38. If you gave me 2011 Kershaw, like I'm putting Kershaw one and like, there's a huge gap, but it's 2023 Clayton Kershaw that we're talking about. Exactly. And the last pitcher I wanted to talk about is a guy who I was really impressed with on Sunday night baseball. And I was on the Braves money line, probably the worst bet of the season so far, considering they lost 10 to two. And the Padres jumped all over Dylan Dodd. But Dylan Dodd's not someone I want to talk about right now. I want to talk about this man, Seth Lugo. And he's a guy who, you know, when we were talking about the Padres rotation at the beginning of the year, we were really nervous, right? Because Michael Walker, Seth Lugo, Nick Martinez, like, what are they going to get from the bottom? We assumed that Musgrove, who hasn't made a pitch yet this season, you Darvish, Blake Snell, they'd be great. But what are we going to get from the bottom? Well, Michael Walker threw six shutout with 10 Ks one of the most surprising starts of the year. And then Seth Lugo goes on Sunday night baseball on the road against this Braves juggernaut of a lineup who normally hit him when he was a reliever for the Mets and flash this incredible high spin curveball that he's always had, but the way that he can place it wherever he wants. And he pairs it with this 91 mile an hour, like sinker ish two seamer fastball thing. He gets outs, man. He looks good. Do I know if it's going to continue for the entire year? No. But right now, he's a guy who I have full faith in can give me five or six innings of very solid baseball. And that's a sentence that, that I had no confidence in saying even a few weeks ago, but he did it twice. And now I'm thinking, all right, like that curveball plays. You know, he's got the command and it's just he gets outs, man. There are two starting pitchers that are consistently snapping off 3,400 RPM curveballs, which is just an insane number. And like, I know spin efficiency, like 100% is, you know, maximum spin, all that shit. Um, I like, I want a physics person to tell me, like, 
you know, the time in which it takes Seth Lugo's curveball to get from his fingertips to the glove, what is the like possible RPM? Because I feel like he's flirting with the impossible here. But the only two starting pitchers that are consistently snapping off 3,300, 3,400 RPM curveballs are the last two guys that you've talked about, Seth Lugo and Dustin May. One more point for Dustin May being an absolute alien life form. But Lugo has had this, man, and like we saw it clipped in three-run games in the seventh inning last year for the Mets. And you were thinking, okay, he does that there. It's a day game. Nobody's there, whatever. What's he going to do in starts for a team that wants to win the World Series and has Machado, Tatis, Soto, Bogarts, Musgrove, Snell, um, Darvish? Like he kind of looks like a four or a five right now, which which is crazy. And and if they get a true four from Seth Lugo this year, I might have to push all my chips in on San Diego. Might have to too. They look really good, and they don't even have Tatis yet. And Bob Melvin, Brent the Grisham. Lefty on lefty nuke job on Sunday night baseball. And on Sunday night baseball, manager Bob Melvin said that he thinks that Fernando Tatis Jr. will lead off for this team. And Bogarts has already done an amazing job. But then you put him in the two hole. You got Soto. You got Machado. I mean, this is just such an entertaining team to watch. But now let's talk about some college baseball with Peter Flaherty. We got the full back half of this episode. That was five pitchers that I really like to watch. And I know Jack does, too. And we'll be back with more MLB baseball on Wednesday. But today, it's Tuesday. It's college baseball. Let's talk to Pete Flaherty.